Okay, this is the southwesternmost point in Iceland. This is essentially about where the plate boundary between the North Atlantic and Eurasian plate comes on shore. So again, Iceland is this kind of anomaly because not only is it a divergent plate boundary where the plates are spreading apart, but it also is believed to be a hot spot. So it's a location where uh, a large amount of magma is a larger than normal amount of magma is coming through that divergent plate boundary, presumably from a, a, a mantle plume, a big uh, plume of magma rising from the Earth's mantle, feeding all these volcanic eruptions we see here in Iceland. And there's a lot going on in this location. Um, we're gonna spend most of our time back up in the shade of the cliffs there. But real quick, we've got uh, this sea stack out here named Carl. That's actually um, a, a an eroded tuff cone, a type of volcano, and just sort of the neck or the core is what's left of it there. The more resistant part of it is what's left and it's eroded away. Um, way out in the distance, you might be able to make out another island. Uh, that's about nine miles or so out. That's Eldi, and that is a, a similar type of volcano where just the the central core, the volcanic neck, the more resistant rocks is all that's left and the rest has eroded away. You gotta remember that um, here we are at the coastline now, but 1,000, 5,000, 12, 15,000 years ago, during times of uh, glacial advances, the ocean was a lot further out. So when we have uh, the glaciers growing in Iceland and other parts of the world, that corresponds with a drop in sea level. So the ocean was actually lower so that these volcanoes, which seem to be way out there, at least this one here was most likely uh, connected to land. LD way out there was probably a submarine eruption uh, built up an island and then the waves uh, consumed and eroded much of that island. So we've got uh, this Pohoihoi lava flow here. Um, these are from a period a very active erupted period called the Reykjavik fires. Uh, I believe that's what they're called from about 1200 or so years ago. Um, but we're gonna work our way up into these cliffs here because from about this point here, we're gonna, we're gonna do another video out there. There's another interesting feature out there, but from about this point here through these cliffs this way, and then working back to the east, we have bedded, volcanic material it's layered let's get up here in the shade and take a good look at it uh we've got all this also these enormous uh boulders rounded boulders from the ocean which really gives you a sense of when uh maybe during high tide and when you've got significant storm events that the waves are able to come up in here and move around and provide energy to these boulders smash them into each other such that they have their corners rounded off um, because these large, I mean, these are even bigger than beach balls, these very large rounded boulders. The, the sea here is just so energetic. It's really quite, quite impressive. Okay, so here we are looking at these bedded uh, volcanic deposits. Um, and we would probably call this, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, so it's mainly made out of ash sized particles but it has enough larger particles in it as well that we actually might add a modifier to the name and call it a lapilli tuff. So lapilli is particles larger than ash, but less than let's say a golf ball. If it's bigger than a golf ball and it's thrown out of the volcano, that's called a bomb. So big material thrown out of a volcano, bigger than a golf ball or so is bombs. From that size, maybe down to a BB size, that would be lapilli, it's an Italian word. And then below BB size, any volcanic material thrown into the air is what we call ash. Collectively, ash, lapilli, and bombs are all called tephra, or sometimes called pyroclastic material, material that's actually ejected into the air because of the explosiveness and the power of the eruption. So just like we add adjectives to things to be more descriptive, so I'm wearing a sweatshirt, but you could also say it's a blue sweatshirt, uh, we sometimes add adjectives to our rock types uh, to be a little bit more descriptive. So this is probably better classified as a lapilli tuff. And you can see there's, there's cinders in here. This is all primary material. This is actually pieces 
of the magma itself. So big clots of vesicular basalt. Um, and in amongst all this ashy material, it's quite crumbly. So that it's no, no wonder that when the ocean gets high, it, it erodes this cliff pretty quickly. Um, so this is a lapilli tuff and in doing a little research on this site this has been interpreted this these volcanic material this volcanic material here has been interpreted as being from a tuff cone i'm not sure how they figured that out unless they had enough aerial distribution that they were able to sort of reconstruct the um the size and the shape of the volcano but a tuff cone remember is when we have magma interacting with water could have been the ocean could have been maybe groundwater um and and producing explosive conditions so it's it's the water being heated by the magma flashing that water to steam expanding and creating explosive conditions where we get um a very explosive eruption that excavates a big crater but also builds up more of a cone so typically it will be taller and um, not as wide as a mar and i did a video um, at greenvatten green lake uh, in iceland which was a, a, a mar uh, if you're from idaho we have a great example of a couple of tough cones in eastern idaho at uh, manan buttes which is near rexburg so we have a a similar um, analog to that. So the main thing I want to look at here is as these eruptions are taking place, um, occasionally within all this bedded tephra, all this lapilli and tuff that's being thrown out of the volcano and being deposited on the landscape, uh, occasionally in addition to all the black chunks of lava, the primary or juvenile material that the volcano is erupting, it also is um, ripping up rocks along the conduit. So rocks along the wall of the vent, it's ripping those up as well. Those get thrown out. Typically they're, not always, but they can be larger than the primary class, like these ones we see here. Um, but they're gonna be a lot more dense too. We can see how highly vesicular this one is it has lots of gas bubbles in it it's very lightweight kind of like a cinder basically is a cinder um, but if we look right here we have a very different color of basalt uh, it's still vesicular but it looks a lot more dense and what this is called is if you look at it this closely you might be able to see that the layers just beneath it are deflected downwards and so this is a volcanic bomb, right? It's bigger than a golf ball. It was thrown out of the vent. It was pyroclastic, it was airborne. But because it's actually depressed or warped the layers beneath it, as it hits the ground and creates a little crater for itself, this is what's called a bomb sag. So this is kind of a neat little feature we sometimes see in these types of eruptions. Notice with these other pieces of lava, they don't produce a bomb sag. They aren't dense enough they're not large enough that when they hit the ash they don't uh, push it downwards compress it and create this little crater here called a bomb sag so uh, pretty neat little um, feature there bomb sag so a a structure or a i guess a sedimentary structure we sometimes see in these uh, volcanic deposits this is an eruption if you need another fun buzzword for the day uh, this is an eruption we would call a Friato magmatic eruption. So Friato is P-H-R-E-A-T-O, magmatic eruption, which means we had lava and, ga and steam from the heating of the groundwater or the water source uh, that drove the eruption. So pretty remarkable. Uh, all these layers in here indicating, um, and then all these clues we can get here as to how the eruption was produced and took place. So we're gonna head over just a few, uh, maybe about a hundred yards or so to the west and look at a really impressive feature uh, over there on those rocks. Okay, still on the southwest coast of Iceland where the plate boundary comes ashore here on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Um, I just did a video about 200 yards or so up against these cliffs here looking at some uh, volcanic features in those bedded 
uh, lapilli tufts, bomb sags, those sorts of things. Um, and over here on these cliffs, we can see we have uh, similar layers. This is actually a different tuff cone, so a different eruptive event and location. And in, and in contrast to the one across the, the bay, we can see that these are capped by lava flows. These lava flows, uh, I believe, are 800 to 1200 years old. And so those are capping these older bedded lapilli tufts down here. Uh, but the real star of the show is something I'm standing on. And so it doesn't look like much, uh, but if we trace this up, we can see that what we have here is a beautiful dike. So this is a conduit of magma working its way through these bedded lapilli tufts. And this specific type of dike is even more exciting because this is what's known as a feeder dike. This dike was feeding, at least in part, the lava flow up above, the basaltic lava flow. So this dike goes right into that lava flow and feeds into that. Presumably there might have been other uh, vents as well. And remember, this dike would go back into the hillsides some unknown distance. Um, but this is just a beautiful example of a feeder dike, the conduit of magma that rose to the Earth's surface, carrying uh, the lava up towards the surface. So let's take a look at this thing up close. I think there's a few interesting features that you might predict. So if we think about, let's back up a bit here. Uh, if we think about this dike, we would expect it to be hot magma working its way towards the surface. But the sides or the walls of this dike, and this dike's only maybe two feet thick, um, would be cooling, right? So we've got cooling happening on either side of the dike um, as it's in contact with these older uh, tufts on each side. And so we'd expect it if it's cooling more rapidly that it would maybe have a finer grain size to it, right? The grains would be, the crystals would be a little bit smaller than in the middle. Uh, so we can see if that's true, we'll go up and look at that. We also might predict that the heat of the lava adjacent to these lapilli tufts might actually cause some welding of these tufts. These tufts are pretty crumbly. You can go up and, and rake them with your hands and they just sort of fall apart. But I think you can already start to see here that there's not only a color change, especially on this side, um, but that the, the tuff sticks out a little bit. It's actually a little bit more resistant. So let's, let's head up and see how those predictions pan out. And this is like the worst. So we've got rounded, slippery boulders on the beach and then nasty angular ones in the talus here. This was not fun to get over here, but we made it. Um, okay, let's step right onto it here. Here we go. Um, right, so let's start out here. So here's actually the contact between the dike and the tuff, and again, the tuff out here is, wow, like calling this rock is really generous, right? Like you can just take this thing and crumble it. And in here, it's definitely more resistant. It's still a little crumbly, but I can definitely feel a difference between this material over here, which you can just rake away with your hands, and this material here, which is much more resistant. So uh, the interpretation would be that the heat of the ascending lava has actually baked and consolidated some of the tuff uh, that it's adjacent to. Um, the other prediction we had was, was the crystal size. So if we look closely here along the wall of the dike, we can see that it's pretty fine grain. I'm not seeing a lot of crystals here. This was cooling quickly, giving us a smaller crystal size. And as we work our way into the interior of the dike, we see two things that are pretty apparent. One is that we're starting to see crystals now. So these little white specks of plagioclase. Um, it looks like there's a few little green crystals of olivine in there, but the point is that they're noticeable. You can actually see these crystals. Some of them are at least a millimeter or more in size. The other interesting thing is that this zone here in the middle has more vesicles in it, more of these gas bubbles in the middle as well. Uh, so. Apparently the quenching over here did not allow the gases uh, to expand, but in the interior they were able to expand as they're moving towards the surface and encountering lower pressure. 
If we move over to the opposite side of the dike, we can see same sort of thing, right? Here's the dike material here. Um, sorry, I need to adjust the camera. And then here's the wall rock. And actually here, there's actually a rind, which is really interesting. Um, a nice hardened, this is super hard here. That would make a great climbing hold. Nice hardened rind up against it. And then over here, we can see the lapilli tuff, right? The grains of bedded pyroclastic material. Um, really just exceptional. Um, these things are just super, super cool, these, these dikes. And this particular one's a feeder dike. A lot of dikes we see in geology um, maybe ascended towards the surface, but never made it to the surface, or else if they did, we can't see where they connected with their surface uh, eruptive feature. And so really kind of cool to see uh, this feeder dike here on the coast in Iceland. Um, and shout out to, I'll maybe put it in the, the notes there, the folks that put together the field guide, they helped me find this thing, GSA field guide to the area. So I'm just, I'm following in the footsteps of other, other people that have done some of this work. So pretty awesome. Uh, hope you're enjoying this. Uh, remember you can donate to the, the expeditions and the travels and the future development of videos but a great little feeder dike cutting through the Lapilli Tuff, feeding into a basalt flow here on the southwest coast of Iceland in the North Atlantic.